Welcome to Clickhole Wednesday, a casual hump day hangout that takes less time to edit than my other shit. Hello ladies and cucumbers, here are the rules to this new game. Either you suggest an article for us to start with, or we just hit random and progress down the clickhole only via links found within the article, hopefully to somewhere entirely unrelated and unexpected. And hopefully we'll learn something interesting. Do leave a comment below if you do. So, since this is new, let's get this going with a random article on Wikipedia. Saint Jean Saint Nicolas. Couldn't pick a saint, I guess? Ooh, very cute. I love how the architecture says Europe, but the background says Kazakhstan. South of France has a population of a thousand. Hmm, okay. Well, that is a tiny random article. The only place we can go is the list of communes. Good lord, there's a lot. Shabastan? I've been to a Persian restaurant called Shabastan. Wow, so much for a click hole. Does this mean long tooth? I suppose it is a bit like a tooth. Okay, how the heck do we get out of these communes? We gotta find a way out. We are gonna be stuck here forever. I do not need it translated, thank you. Um, let's find one with an interesting name. Fermire. That doesn't sound particularly French. Let's go to Fermire. God, no information on these communes. Right, well, let's go straight to commune. Oh, communes of France, okay, yikes. Miscellaneous facts. That's right up our alley. Paris is the most populous commune of France. Six of the French villages destroyed in the First World War have never been rebuilt. All are found in the département of Meuse and were destroyed during the Battle of Verdun in 1916. After the war, it was decided that the land previously occupied by the destroyed villages would not be incorporated into other communes as a testament to these villages which had died for France as they were declared and to preserve their memory. The falling communes are entirely unpopulated and are managed by a council of three members, appointed by the prefect of Meuse. Hmm, this means something of the dead man. Ghost commune, oh my god, they're called ghost communes. So they've got something there. Oh my god, that looks very gothic. Oh, that's the tiniest church I've ever seen. Is that a church? What is that? Okay, I'm torn between, wait, visiting the tiny church or this one because it's literally called Dead Man. You know what, let's go for Tiny Church. I'm I'm curious about the Tiny Church. Okay, during the war the town was completely destroyed and the land was made uninhabitable to such an extent that a decision was made not to rebuild it. The site of the commune is maintained as a testimony to war and is officially designated as a village that died for France. Okay, we read that. There's no information about the Tiny Chapel. There's a picture of it though. Is that a wedding or a memorial? I can't tell. Must be a memorial. Well, that is a very tiny chapel. I do, I would, would you wish they said if it was built or s built after it was destroyed? They do say completely. So I assume that was built afterwards, but interesting. Hmm, where can we go from here? Official population zero. Do they actually bother putting population on that? It's kind of interesting. We can either go straight to World War One, or we can continue looking at this French department. What do they mean by department? Let's go there. One of the three levels of government under the national level in France. There are 96 departments in metropolitan France, five are overseas. Meuse is a department in northeast France named after the river Meuse. Oh my god, am I dying for a vacation right about now? That is nice. Screw this, I'm heading right to the river. Oh, oh baby. Man, what I would do for a vacation right now. That is a sweet little picturesque area. I'm into it. Right, okay. The Meuse is a major European river. Where is it? Oh, I see. Oh, okay, so it goes through a bunch of countries. Major European river rising in France and flowing through Belgium in, and the Netherlands before draining into the North Sea. Oh, so it's an upside down river, a bit like the Nile. How interesting. How long is it? 575 miles. From 1301, the upper Meuse roughly marked the western border of the Holy Roman Empire with the Kingdom of France. Hmm. Bet there were some battles fought along that. It's lower Belgian portion, part of the Silon Industriel, was the first fully industrialized area in continental Europe. The Meuse and its crossings were a key objective of the last major German World War II counteroffensive on the Western Front, Battle of the Bulge, in the winter of 44-45. Oh, so it's been a very important bit of land. 
See also 1930 Meuse Valley Fog. Yes, I think I will. What is that? Oh my god, it killed people. 1930 Meuse Valley Fog killed 60 people in Belgium due to a combination of industrial air pollution and climatic conditions in December that year. What? Is it because it was really um, industrialized? Yes, densely populated as well as having many factories. There were several thousand cases of illness over the period of two or three days, with the 60 deaths occurring at the same time. 56 of the deaths were to the east of Ingus. Main symptom was dyspnea, shortness of breath. Well, that sounds familiar. And the average age of those who died was 62. That also sounds familiar. Over a range of ages, 20 to 89 years. Cattle in the area were also affected. Danish scientist and world's leading authority in fluorine determined that it was the fluorine gas from the nearby factories that was the killer. The exact date for this disaster is unknown. Really? We know it occurred in December. It killed 60 people over three days, but we don't actually know the date. It's a little weird, isn't it? You figure people knew the date at the time. This isn't exactly, you know, an unknown location. Oh, so it's a smog. Mmm. Right, so from here we can go to some other smogs. How exciting. Got regular smog. St. Louis smog, Donora smog. We can get a preview. The 1948 Donora smog killed 20 people and caused respiratory problems for 7,000 people. The 14,000 population of Donora, Pennsylvania. Great smog of London was 1952. New York City smog, Harbin smog. I think I remember that. Smog in Delhi. What was the St. Louis smog? Visibility was so limited that streetlights remained lit throughout the day and motorists needed their headlights to navigate city streets. Tragically being in California at this time with the fires, we had a day where all the lights had to be on the entire day and I felt jet lagged. It is very disturbing. Um, I don't know, what do I wanna look at? Let's go to, I don't know why I'm to leaning towards the St. Louis smog. Smoke pollution had been a problem in St. Louis for many decades prior to the event due to the large scale burning of bituminous soft coal to provide heat and power for homes, businesses, and transport. In 1893, the council passed an ordinance prohibiting the emission of thick gray smoke within the corporate limits of St. Louis, but was unable to enforce it because of failed legal action action taken against Heitzberg Packing and Provision Company, one of the worst corporate offenders. We still have a few, that's for sure. Effectiveness of laws was also limited by the lack of adequate inspection and enforcement. Well, when there's money involved, that's what happens. So all the homes used coal. Soon realized that real improvement would only come about by switching to a cleaner fuel such as gas, oil, coke. Coke is a, f coke is a gray hard porous fuel with a high carbon content and few impurities. Interesting or anthracite were all considered, but ruled out on cost grounds. The alternative was to wash and size the existing soft coal to make it burn hotter and cleaner, and ensure that all coal sold in St. Louis was of this variety. Jewel box. Jewel box, a municipal greenhouse that was built because of high smog and soot levels. Also known as the St. Louis Floral Conservatory, now serves as a public horticultural facility. Consists of five stepped composition covered wood roofs with Clara stories rather than a regular glass roof in order to prevent damage from frequent hailstorms. Wise, wise architectural decision, I think. In 1913, Nelson Cunliffe became Commissioner of Parks and Rec for St. Louis City. Due to high levels of smoke and soot within the city, he began a survey to determine which plants could survive the conditions. He later asked John Moritz, who was in charge of the city's greenhouses, to set up a display greenhouse to showcase various plants which could survive. It is said that someone called the displays like a jewel box, hence the name. So they made a greenhouse to sh showcase the plants that could survive being outside the greenhouse? Or was the greenhouse full of smog? I don't understand. Do you understand? I'm not sure I understand. How about, where do we go from here? I don't know. Bernard Dickman sounds like a good click. Let's go with that. He was the 34th mayor of St. Louis. God, that's a bizarre time frame to live from. Born in 1888 and dies in 1971. I mean, that's a crazy kind of time period in terms of technology to witness. And changes in society. Can you imagine being born in like Victorian era and then it's cocaine and dancing? <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big jump. Okay, let's see. What about you, Dickman? Dickman started work at the age of 16, working for a lumber company. During World War I, he enlisted in the Marine Corps. His later business career was in real estate. Interesting. Dickman's election marked the first time in 24 years that a Democrat had been elected mayor. 
It also marked the first time a Democrat was elected with the support of a formidable African-American political organization. During his administration, the city acquired and cleared the land along the riverfront front that would become the Gateway Arch National Park. He sought a third term as mayor in 1941 and was defeated by a Republican. He was a delegate to the Missouri Constitutional Convention in 1943. In the same year, he was appointed St. Louis Postmaster, a position he held until 1958. While serving as postmaster, he got married to Beulah Pat Harrington, the postmistress. Oh, he found love at the post office. He found love at his job. Oh, a postmaster and a postmistress. That is kind of cute. <laughs> Two postmasters falling in love. Gotta love it. The popular street bridge crossing Mississippi River at St. Louis is named in his honor. Is it though? Because wouldn't it be the Dickman Bridge? Wouldn't it? Just saying. But then again, I guess popular street <laughs> definitely comes across as nicer. Okay, where do we go from here? Um, let's go to Mount Olive, Mississippi. It's currently got less than a thousand people. Uh, the town of Mount Olive was incorporated on May 18th, 1900, making the town older than McGee to the north and older than Collins to the south. That is a very specific measurement of age. Does the average person know what McGee and Collins are? I feel like that's something you know if you live in this area in Mississippi, but maybe not the average person. At least I don't, but I'm an idiot, so what can I say? Oh, the railroad tracks were completed the year prior to being incorporated. So let's see, in 2010, the population was 982, and six years later, they lost seven people. <laughs> Whoopsies. Well, that's pretty much it for this article, to be honest, aside from demographic stats. From the 2000 census, that's now 20 years old. Median income at the time was very low. 22,000. Median income. Ooh. Oh my god. Males had a median income of $26,000 versus $16,000 for women. Per capita income for the town was $11,000. Damn. Over a third of the population below the poverty line. Well, Mount Olive, I uh, hope you've improved since. Where do we go from here? What's Mies? 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 Don't know how to pronounce it. Home of the Mississippi Watermelon Festival. Can't be missed. Why isn't there a Wikipedia page for that? I would click it. Damn. Very disappointing. Mize. We're gonna we're gonna call it Mize because I don't know how else to pronounce it. Mize was settled by Europeans by the early 1900s on the Gulf and Ship Island Railroad lines. Though immigrants from Scotland may have settled the area as early as 1810. Choctaw Indians had lived in the area for thousands of years, forced westward by the early 1800s. It was a sundown town, meaning African Americans were not welcome. It is proximate to Sullivan's Hollow, Mississippi, the home of outlaw William Cicero Wild Bill. Oh, interesting. I really wanted to click on Mississippi Watermelon Festival and I'm really heartbroken that I can't. That is just, that is a travesty. Um, from here, let's go to, hell, let's go far away. Notable person from here is Eugene Sims, a professional football player. I know nothing about American football, so, you know, if you do, prepare to cringe. Is there a personal life? No, I always like reading the personal life bit. I understand nothing. I understand nothing on this page. That's a shame. Now where the heck do I go from here? Let's check out where he started his college career. Jones County Junior College. It's a public community college in Ellisville, Mississippi. Notable faculty? Football coaches. NFL, NFL. Oh, apparently this college does nothing but produce football players and coaches. Oh, here we go. Other, thank God. Um, get me out of football. I don't understand it. I'm sorry. Charles W. Pickering, former Mississippi State Senator and retired judge. I love how this this entire judge title reads like a bloody Game of Thrones title. Stacy Pickering, State Auditor of Mississippi. Red West, actor. That is such an actor name. Case Sherman, professional mixed martial arts. No, let's go for Red West. Yes, he looks exactly the way I pictured. Red West was an American actor, film stuntman, and songwriter. Oh, he died quite recently. He was known for being a close confidant and bodyguard for Elvis Presley. Damn, that's a job. He has seen some shit. Yeah, he also played football. What do you know? Something about this Jones County Junior College. Y'all going nuts for football. 
No, 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 no. That doesn't count as part of the click hole. We're still here. Okay, so he's born in Memphis. He was the cousin of actor Sonny West. While attending high school in Tennessee, West and Sonny met with Elvis Presley. You know, I feel like there's 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 a, there's a loophole right here in this story. What? Did Elvis go there? Like they met with him? It doesn't say they met him there. I feel like there's definitely a bit of this story missing. Okay, West and Presley collaborated on songs. In what way? That's very vague. Did he sing? Did he play something? Oh, he wrote. He co-wrote. Okay. Hmm. In 1976, West was criticised in the media for his involvement in a series of heavy-handed incidents with aggressive fans in Las Vegas. You know what? I'm really annoyed that this article doesn't give details on the stuff you want to have details about. He was also becoming vocal about Presley needing help for his drug problem. Elvis's father hated the members of his son's entourage, fired West, his cousin Sonny, and bodyguard David Hebler. Oh dear. wonder what would have happened if he didn't. The three subsequently wrote the book Elvis What Happened. You don't know because you got fired. Claiming to be an attempt to warn and obtain help for Elvis. Some suspected it was a retaliatory money-making exercise, but with Elvis's death within weeks of publication, the book's claims proved accurate. Ooh. That's tragic, but also very satisfying for Red and Sonny, and David, I guess, because yeah, they ended up being right. Well, Presley had offered the publisher a million dollars to stop printing the book. Good thing they didn't bite. These guys, these three are now vindicated. Acting career, he's done quite, quite a lot, to be honest. Oh man, he died less than two months after his cousin Sonny. That happens, doesn't it, when people are close? Here's his filmography. All right, where do we go from here? Let's check out his cousin. Looks like there's more details on Sonny's page. Friend and bodyguard of the singer Elvis with Red for 16 years as part of the Elvis entourage. At the Elvis Memphis home Graceland, which became known as the Memphis Mafia. Oh, I have heard that, actually. West was one of two sons and five daughters. Both West and Elvis grew up in different lower income projects. I didn't know that Elvis grew up in a lower income project. That's interesting. Oh, but they never actually met in childhood. Okay, so here's some more details. West met Elvis in 1958 at a roller skating rink. After a discharge from the US Air Force, West, working as a washer and dryer repairman, went to work for Elvis as a bodyguard. Memphis Mafia. Memphis Mafia was the nickname given by rock and roll icon Elvis Presley to a group of friends, associates, employees, and cousins, whose main functions were to accompany, protect, and serve Elvis from the beginning of his career in 1954 until his death in 1977. Several members filled practical roles in the singer's life. Bodyguards, tour logistics, scheduling. God, that is a mafia. That's, that's La Familia right there. Paid salaries, but most of them lived off fringe benefits such as gifts, cars, houses, and bonuses. Not a bad deal. Not a bad deal. Elvis buys you a house, a present, a car. Gives you a little bonus. Yeah. <laughs> you do it. Over the years, the number of members grew and changed, but for the most part, there was a cool group who spent much time with the singer. Interesting that despite so much close support, he still went off the edge and suffered. Presley and his friends and employees also adopted the acronym TCB, which meant taking care of business. That is such a mafia thing. Presley had the tail of his private jet painted with the initials TCB and a lightning bolt, and gave away gold and diamond chain necklaces with TCB and TLC logos as gifts. Elvis's wife Priscilla helped with the creation of this logo on a flight through stormy conditions. A lightning bolt flashed across the sky in front of them and Elvis took inspiration from it. Priscilla sketched out the design on notepaper, positioning the letters and lightning bolt in various ways before they found what they liked. Interesting. Taking care of business, for sure. Various members of the Memphis Mafia had played vital roles in keeping Elvis's numerous dirty secrets out of the public eye. Collecting drugs for him, few took physical hits in protecting him, and none were paid more than $500 a week. But wouldn't $500 a week be kind of a significant payment for the time? Party life. Elvis and his guys were all living on speed and tranquilizers. That's a combo. It was a party like you wouldn't believe. Go to a different show every night, then pick up a bunch of women afterwards, go to a party the next night. Go to the lounges, see Fats Domino, Della Reese with Jackie Wilson, the Four Aces, the Dominoes, all the old acts. We'd stay there and never sleep. We were all taking pills just so we could keep up with each other. And that's how you burn out fast. Interesting that his dad distrusted and disliked the, Mel the Memphis Mafia, even though the core Red and Sunny West tried to save Elvis. They honestly did enjoy partying on Elvis's coattails, that's for sure. 
Presley's enormous wealth allowed him an ability to separate himself from the general public, especially in Memphis. For example, he would rent an entire movie theatre to watch a film. It's pretty cushy. Among Memphis natives, he was most known for renting out the entire Memphis amusement park Liberty Land in order to ride his favourite roller coaster, the Zippin' Pippin. Zippin' Pippin, ladies and cucumbers. One of the oldest existing wooden roller coasters in the US. There it is. Out of all the coke and drugs and everything, it's the Zippin' Pippin that gave Elvis a thrill. Wait, Wisconsin? How'd it end up in Wisconsin? Oh. Liberty Land closed in 2005 and then Green Bay bought it and in 2010 it was installed at the Bay Beach Amusement Park. Amazing you can just buy a roller coaster and relocate it. It was originally built, wow, in either 1912, 1915 or 1917. Why do they not know which it is? <laughs> That's three oddly specific years. Got damaged by a tornado in 1928 and it was re took 45 grand to rebuild it. Wow. And it was sold at auction for two and a half grand. Having initially planned to bid on only one of the roller coaster cars, you could buy an entire roller coaster for two and a half grand. It cost 45,000 to rebuild in 1928. Wow, that's a bargain. What did it cost to relocate it though? Bet you that cost a fortune. So they only wanted to buy a roller coaster car and ended up with the entire roller coaster. Sale agreement required the buyer to remove the ride within 30 days. Consulted with a coaster expert to determine the practicality of moving the entire coaster to another location. And they did it somehow. 3.8 million, there you go. Two and a half thousand dollar bid to purchase it, but ended up costing 3.8 mil to move and, and rebuild. That's quite, yikes, did they make their money back? 2016, a Zippin' Pippin' train collided with an empty one in the loading area. Three people had minor injuries. 2017, the ride was temporarily shut down for repairs due to a sensor issue. The ride's train is in the station and no one was ever stuck on the ride, city workers say. Did anybody claim anybody was stuck or are you just going out of your way to say nobody got stuck? Weird. The ride was shut down for two and a half weeks last summer after a set of cars failed to stop and crashed into the train ahead. <sighs> Zippin' Pippin did not want to be moved, what can I say? Zippin' Pippin wanted to live in Memphis with Elvis's ghost. That seems to be the case, because the only incidents are in the years since it was moved, even though the thing got ripped up by a tornado and was originally built before fridges were mainstream. Well, I think maybe we'll end there. We've gone from a strangely named French commune to the Zippin' Pippin, once upon a time in Memphis, Tennessee, now in Green Bay, Wisconsin because that's what happens when it's Click Hole Wednesday. If you enjoyed riding the Zippin' Pippin down into the deep, dark recesses of the Click Hole, please like this video. It lets me know that you enjoyed this more casual, less edit-heavy content. Share, subscribe, let me know if you learned anything here, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!